Hi! Welcome back to Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, the super awesome podcast show where me, your artist friend Chris Dyer, talks to his very beautiful, inspiring, creative friends. Uh, today I'm in beautiful, sunny Boulder, Colorado. We're still in the middle of winter and I'll be visiting my artist friend Amanda Sage. Woo! Uh, Amanda is a really great painter. Uh, an artist who's lived around the world, inspiring thousands of people. She's a community person. She's an empowered female role model to so many people. And an old friend of mine who I've known for over 10 years. So I'm really excited for this conversation. I hope you enjoy it too. Blessings! Between a woman and a man, Chris Dyer and his creative friends, darling. Ooh, 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 ooh. Let's get to it, Amanda. How are you doing? <laughs> Woo! Thank you for having me out here in the beautiful mountains of Boulder, Colorado. Where are we exactly today? We are actually right in the side yard of where I grew up. Nice. So you're from Boulder originally, right? Well, I was actually born in, in Denver. Um, okay. And we moved then. My parents moved to Florida when I was like a year old. Oh, no way. And then my brothers were born there at home and we were homeschooled and ran around like little feral children with no shoes. And Which had part the best, of Florida? Best time. About an hour north of Miami, Deerfield Beach. Okay, cool. And then we moved back here when I was in fourth grade, going into fourth grade. Um, and the Waldorf School, Shiny Mountain Waldorf School is just down the road, mm -hmm. like seven minutes from here. And um, that's where I went to school. Nice. You've lived also in Vienna, you've lived in Asia, in Bali, I believe, you lived in Los Angeles, but now you're back here. What's good about this area that despite the beauty you've seen around in other parts of the world, you've come back here, the state in general? The state, yeah. I mean, Colorado is a big state and I'm actually, my, my base is about four hours southwest of here in Gunnison. I mean, that's where I've spent a lot more time the past like couple years, and then also more and more over the past six years. Um, I still have a studio in LA, and I bounce in and out and have like, you know, my family there too. It's kind of like wherever I go, I feel like I make, you know, I put down some roots, I make friends, and I feel like connected. I, I kind of never want to leave anywhere. <laughs> People mm -hmm. always ask me like, where's my favorite spot? I'm like, there's favorite spots all over the place. It's like wherever I am currently at that time, I find something beautiful and I find wonderful people wherever I am too. But this area, I think Colorado, you know, come and leave I left the country when I was, when I was 18. And I don't know if, I mean, I didn't really have any specific plans, but I didn't really think I would necessarily come back. And so coming back to the U.S., I landed in downtown LA, but I also, you know, was kind of, like being there and being so integrated in like with my beautiful little community on a rooftop in downtown LA, I was looking for an outpost too. And so to be like in Colorado, it feels really, I feel really connected to Colorado. I love the place. My family's still here, my parents. So yeah, it seemed like the right space. And my partner, Joe Bob, he was really the one that, that called me out to Gunnison. And uh, he's got a really cool place. It's an old sawmill that he's turned into an artifactory. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like the dream. I have a beautiful garden there in the summers and amazing workshops and studios. And we have a somatic art studio space for yoga. And, and we do ecstatic dance there. And it's a really experimental like operation, you know, in the middle of, um, in the middle of uh, a town. It's like south end of Main Street. And so, I mean, I'm attracted to be at all these different different places but Colorado has definitely been like a calling and it's cool because there's a lot of different artists and a lot of movement happening I feel like in Colorado and I think it's a good place to stake down. 
Mm -hmm. do, do you um, still feel the need of renting your spot in LA if you, you like, you know, finding your groundation here? You know, it's like, it's a flow. It's a thing that I'm trying to, I don't know what the answer is, like what's like next year going to bring, what's next month going to bring, but there's been enough reasons for me to continue to, to keep that spot and I rent it to, to an artist um, that, that enjoys having that space and keeps the garden alive and there's like a beautiful, a beautiful um, a, a collaboration with, with some of my friends there, Shabnam Q, she's been doing the clothing line with me for like seven, eight years now and she lives in the same building. And we have we work with all these small producers that live in downtown LA that work in downtown LA and we love like this relationship of being able to connect with all these like you know people personally and she's a designer and she loves being there even though it's a pretty tough place to live in a way mm -hmm. it's also like it's a place that I knew is kind of the end of the world like the end of the rainbow and it was like in the midst of that there was so much beauty but also so much like suffering Right. That, and to be confronted with that, uh -huh. to not just like run off to the to the forest somewhere was important to me. Like I've because I feel really deeply about humanity, uh, humanity's kind of evolution, but also not being stuck in a in an ideal perspective of it. Right. Which like you can have depending on your surroundings. Mm -hmm. But being confronted with it there is kind of like, uh, you know, let's be real like. Well, the there's healer's got to be in the trenches, too. Yeah. If, you, if you're just in the paradise, there's not that fire under your ass to be like, I got to change this. And downtown LA, it's like, it's, it's a mess. Right, right. It's a total mess. And shout out to my friend Sherry Ray and uh, the work that she's done with Peace Yoga and how many people she's fed through her amazing food and, and, the, and the yoga and the kind of like... You know the energy that she brings is it super inspiring and she was one of the reasons that i decided to to you know to stay there and also nathan cartwright from the hive gallery uh -huh. and i've met so many light workers in that area and um you know so i mean i feel just like this this love for all the places i've been and the people too and i wish i could be in all the places at once you mm. know there's a kind of a guilt that i feel for not being um continuing to be present in all of the places but that's kind of like I've also accepted the you know the the reality of of being a butterfly <laughs> right yeah and a pollinator you uh -huh. know? True. and I hope in all the places and with all the people that I meet I get to you know share some of the good and 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 let that continue to emanate you know but I feel the responsibility to come back and 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 nurture the the growth that happens and the changes I mean, because life is this constantly um, morphing, changing, experience. You never know how many times you're going to get to see each other, you know? So right. we got to be, take every moment as precious. And mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Well, I agree and resonate with uh, both the need to have a groundation spot like you have in Gunnison, but also move around and uh, do your services in different places that are needed. So good for you. So I wanted to leave this question for the end because it's more of a recent thing, but I kind of <laughs> feel like I had to tackle it right away. We <laughs> used to be a couple dreadheads a mere year ago, and now we're a couple bald heads. <laughs> Amanda Sage, why do you cut your big, beautiful dreadlocks? <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, I knew it was going to come eventually. Like, I was feeling it probably... Like a year and a half ago, a couple years ago, it was like there was something that I, I could feel the time would come. You know, people would ask me this. I'm sure they'd ask you, too, like all the time. Like, mm -hmm. are you, what are you going to do? Where are you? Yeah. And, and for me, I was like, I'll know when I know. Uh -huh. Like, and when the time comes, when spirit, spirit speaks to me, whatever it is, I just, I'll know. How many years did you have him? Fourteen. Okay. So it's a long time. It was a significant amount of time, you know, and the whole the whole time it was like something that became like a it was a symbolic commitment. Uh, it was also something that really like, I don't know, it fueled it fueled me. It fueled a story. It fueled a like um, the building also of a character in many ways that was also um, not confined to like a to me, it wasn't a confinement of, uh, to an image or identity, although it seemed to turn into that, mm -hmm. right? right? To me, it was like, 
it was a bit of a rebellious thing in the beginning to do that, right? To right. dread my hair. Um, and I feel like the way that I learned to do it, how I would knot everyone myself, you know, it became like a, like a, an honoring of the moments I found myself in. Also with the people and the experiences, it was like a record, right? Mm -hmm. Like I was recording in some way each of the, each of the, um, steps of the journey yeah steps of the journey and then so what happened is like I went through a really intense beginning of this year like the going out of 2021 and 2021 was a really strange year for me it was really challenging actually like I went through kind of like a crisis internally that felt like I don't know was it like a mid career crisis I don't want to say like a midlife crisis but I went into a lot of questioning and felt like there was something that I couldn't really break through, um, though I tried. There was something that was hovering around me. I kind of doubt, insecurity, some fears that were just like not, didn't feel natural and good. Like I didn't feel excited to step up to new challenges, even though I was like constantly in them. And my nature has always been really like pretty adventurous and, and spontaneous and also like like, sure, I'll carry that torch. But I wasn't feeling it, you know, even though I was like trying to keep it up. And it's so, a hard role to continually be on that yeah. position of, you know, a leader or guide to a lot of people. Sometimes we need a break. And I think that's what kind of where I was at. Like I'd been teaching for 10 years straight and I'd been like, I felt like touring all the time and, and just juggling. I felt like I was just juggling and juggling. And I couldn't stop. You know, and there was never like, there was never a break. Like I never just took a break because I just, I was excited for all the things I was doing and I loved everything I was doing. But I think like, yeah, I needed, I needed to slow down. And so I took a break of teaching in 2021 and that kind of like gave me some space. I was like, I'm just going to focus on this show. I had a solo show in a museum in, um, in Arizona at the Mesa, Mesa Contemporary Arts Museum. And so that felt really good to focus towards that and some other shows. But it was like, yeah, something needed to shift. Like the Vision Train was this amazing community, right? That's that, that we started at the beginning of the, of the pandemic online. But it was also like, I was feeling like I, I needed to step up in a new way. So anyway, came around to New Year's, ended up getting really sick, my family and I, mm -hmm. COVID or not, whatever it Omicron. was. Omicron. We we were sick, yeah. right? And um, and going through that, like, really brought a lot into perspective, you know, like the mortality and also the preciousness of, of life. And I, you know, had a really profound experience with my, with my parents. Mm -hmm. And it was like through that, I, um, you know, it hit me on one day, it was like, okay, they're going to live. My mom's going to live. Mm -hmm. And I asked her like the next day, I was like, will you, when, when you're feeling better, will you do the honors? Wow. You know? And it was like, it was the kind of, it was, it was a choice that was not made because of anything strategic in terms of like my career or anything like that. Like, right. It was a completely, um, spontaneous. It was like press the, spontaneous press the reset button, right. you know? And what does it really mean? Because I think also what had happened is that I had started, there were other people in my life and also the external world reflected back to me how important my hair was. Mm -hmm. And it kind of made like more, with more and more time, it was like, really? Yeah. Who cares about this dead cells bunched up on my skull? <laughs> I mean, I felt like it was something, my hair gave me a kind of interesting passport, even through, throughout the world where people, maybe sometimes they'd be a little judgmental, but for the most part, people were curious. Mm -hmm. And it opened up a door into worlds for them that they didn't, really didn't have access to. Mm -hmm. And I loved, like, for an example, going through airports mm -hmm. and like TSA or like security or in any situation. Really? I where hate people, airports with trans. <laughs> no, for me, I saw it as an opportunity to like to share the love uh -huh. and so I always give people stickers I never yeah. impose it or I try not to impose it but like yeah. if you want it but it was like it was like a way for people to see of course like the way I would dress or whatever but the hair stood out the most right, right? and so it kind of would help break down barriers it's a nice breaker yeah 
yeah. but it would break down barriers too for people mm -hmm. between like that judgment of like oh you look different you look weird you know it was something that that people through my niceness or be kindness or my vibration we could like you know break down some some judgments maybe you know mm -hmm. so to me i found that really valuable but it also kind of got me stuck mm -hmm. like i also felt like started to feel like a, a slave almost to a, an image that i had become but and that was fine but i didn't like feel authentic and continuing to to speak through that or to feed it you know mm -hmm. so it's like with all love and respect and gratitude and the ceremony was like I couldn't stop crying like it was just such a such a release but I realized through it it was like all that time all that commitment was so that I could go through that process of letting it go mm -hmm. you know and that was huge you know so it feels like it feels like a relief like quite literally you know you're not right. like concerned yeah about it's a letting anything. go for sure yeah so do you feel like Cutting the dreads in a way is a way for you to break out of these boxes of image that maybe we created for ourselves, but maybe we have grown them and we're ready to step into the newest version of ourselves. And it's like, you know, I'm not really Amanda Sage, the dreadlock artist. Yes, I am, but I can also, I am so much more inside. And maybe by breaking this box, I can allow myself to just flourish into the next version of myself. For sure, you know? I think it's also like whatever's in your way, I like to think is in your way and like dance with it, move around it. Like everything is impermanent, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, why not do that now? Why not face it now? So like authenticity is something like we've been talking about a lot today, right? And I feel like that's something that you're really passionate about and I feel too, like I know that if I'm authentic, then I'm going to be the most, I'm going to be the best trans, transmitter. I'm going to be the best like that I can be, right? Like the work shows that. Like my artwork, if I'm not being authentic, if I'm not feeling in the flow, then it's, it's more challenging to like, to get to that space of that truth, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think, we're in a time too now in the world where it's like we don't have time in a way to get a, to to waste right we got to get straight to it we got to get to the to the heart of the matter now yeah we got to cut the cut the crap yeah and not that our <laughs> dreads were crap but it can become crap if they um become too strong of an attachment mm -hmm. of a identity thing I mean, I think like the trendy aspect too is something that also, you know, became, I, I noticed that more and more, there, there were quite a few people that idolized me because of that, you know? And it's like, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's not a fashion statement. It didn't feel like that to me, right. but that's what it became more and more. But I think that's what also happens through the nature of social media and the nature of like, the, you know the world and it's like your image you have to be something that people like want to be like you mm -hmm. know totally but i i want people i want people to be their true selves and how do you how do you find that i mean even in painting or in making art when you're in the beginning you got to try a lot of things out right it's mm -hmm. okay to do that too you mm -hmm. know but then what is really like your calling what what is what you need and i think a lot of people are afraid to be that are afraid, afraid to really like share that because they've been imposed their whole lives they've been conditioned to be something else to believe they have to be something else to be loved to be celebrated to be successful you know it's really confusing right <laughs> because at the end of the day the only true real happiness is by knowing who we are inside loving that and that expanding and not always having to fish for you know those external validations or compliments and the world telling you like okay you're good because you're, you're beautiful looking or because you make beautiful art is that truly us or is that just in a reflection of something that's inside that we're trying to shine out yeah. right do you feel like in the same way you uh maybe scrapped your your image that you're like ah oh, let's cut the dreads off this is 
you know, let's bring it back to a blank canvas. Do you think that's something that can be done in our personal artistic style? Yeah, of course. And I think we, we, we need to. I think we should. Like, you know, we're, everything's happening faster and faster. And there's so many different ways to be, um, to be active, you know, and to share your voice. And I think in some ways, like, like we all share too much. Like it's, it's an overstimulating environment that we live in, you know, whereas we don't take enough time to actually really consider what it is that we really need, what's really healthy for us. And so it's like finding that balance where, you know, finding that balance and also exploring, you know, because on one hand, we're living now in a great era of transition, right? And it feels like a lot. It's like too much. And so like all of the suggestions to like <sighs> breathe, come back to your center. It's like we need that more than ever. And we also need to remember that we need to live in, in multiple worlds. We need to be surfing, right? Like constantly, the, like being able to pay your bills and at the same time exploring this incredible opportunity to be alive, you know? So mm -hmm. as an artist, like we have this like opportunity too where there's all the styles are you know, I'm sure there's still going to be more to come. All the tools are available, like no matter how you want to express, there's going to be a gallery that wants to probably support you. And there's going to be collectors that want to support you. Right. We live in an epic time. 50 years ago, that wasn't the case. Right. And so, like, why not explore it all? But of course, if you become too fractal, then you also have a hard time finding a center place. Right. Mm -hmm. So it is good. Like, explore it all but find something that really resonates and pull the and thread keep going keep going and don't mm -hmm. stop because every single person has a signature right? right like the way you draw a line and the way you like the colors that you're going to choose is going to be different than everybody else mm -hmm. sometimes i find it's even unescapable when i try to break away from my style and i'll try to do something totally different still chris shows up to uh, you know create that filter that people can still be like oh that still kind of looks like a chris dyer i uh, know do you think uh, but we don't really have to escape 100 percent. we can't escape who we are and the filter of ourselves but maybe we can uh create new songs yeah create new, new songs and collaborate with others like i think it's a beautiful thing to to have your like have your song like your authentic song and that's like what's that's the way your line flows through you and then like dance with others, you know, mm -hmm. and even dance with other like one day you may be feeling completely different than, uh, you know, another time you want to try something else mm -hmm. and see how that like comes through and be curious. I think like the most important thing is to be curious, you know, mm -hmm. but I find like sometimes I don't make enough space to really um, to really break out of like the you know, the voice that I feel that just comes through me naturally to really explore. But I think it's important that we do, you know, that we do take those moments and those like challenges maybe from others or other opportunities to step out of our comfort zone. Like that's, that's also where you kind of like are, go into a space of kind of releasing a kind of control. And then you can become, um, you know, even more like, uh, rich in 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 your in your context you know of your associations and how you can blend all the fields and I mean I'm just I'm interested in in the exploration I think so that's what like every time I approach a new painting or a project it's like okay let's see what happens right yeah and if it comes out beautiful or not either way you had a new experience which enriched your your being and taught you something for sure I mean that's what it's about you know, otherwise it gets boring. Mm -hmm, <laughs> totally. So let us go back to, to, to the roots. Um, you grew up here. You went to a Waldorf school? Waldorf. Waldorf school. Tell me a little bit about the Waldorf. It's like a special school for special mutants <laughs> to bring out your superpowers, right? <laughs> totally. <laughs> Like yeah. Professor Sevier is the main dude behind it? Rudolf Steiner. Sevier Steiner. Okay. Rudolf Steiner. Yeah, Rudolf Steiner created the Waldorf School like over 100 years ago. 
um, in Germany and it was created for like the children of a cigarette factory actually. Oh wow. But they were mutants. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but he was he was really interested in like supporting the full human being, you know, like mm -hmm. the cultivation of like a wholesome human, and that being through like he's he studied um, Goethe in a in his color theory and like the nature of color and the relation the relationality of everything. So it's kind of like the Waldorf school is built in like a spiral of a, of a way of the development of a child. So you kind of like, you learn, learn one thing, like say about biology, and then it like flows into um, history, which flows into theater, which flows into agriculture, which flows into, you know, everything's connected. And in that way, like, I mean, now I look back on that and I'm like, that's absolutely beautiful, you know? There's a lot of things, I think, within the Waldorf system that is really foundational um, for, for supporting, like, the crea creative human to be, like, stable in, in the world because of the foundations of, of movement and music and art and, like, all of it. It's, like, woven. It's a, it's a very much like an oral um, teaching. Like a lot of the lessons when you're when you're a young person are taught through stories, mm -hmm. and then you remember them. You have to write them down in your own words, mm. and then it go. You, and then you have to write them beautifully in your main lesson book, and you have to do beautiful like uh, borders and and pictures alongside with the writing. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's like instead of learning from textbooks and somebody else is just telling you how it goes, you know, it goes through your own filtration and your own creativity is invited to come through. And in that way, I think is like, yeah, we're all artists, you know? Like we, we should be reminded that we're not, and it shouldn't be like taken out of us when we're young. And there's such a conditioning that like an artist has to be somebody that's like selling art or to be called an artist, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, that's what I hope in this lifetime that I can help millions of people remember that they're artists. Mm -hmm. If that's possible, I will feel really stoked like because I think if we can remember that and realize that it's not something that needs to be um, validated through commerce, then we'll be more healthy and maybe more balanced human beings. Right. Yeah. Well, that reminder, it's kind of like reminding people that they are reflections of God, the creator, you know, like by stimulating the creativity in each and one of us. So that sounds like a very beautiful, stimulating beginning to the Amanda, Amanda Sage Road. Uh, I, I think once you told me you had a teacher that was like a really amazing a visionary artist that really inspired you to bring more of that vision from you. Uh, so I want to ask you, who is this teacher? And also, when you were younger, were you more in tune with your psychic abilities that begged for it to be expressed? And maybe that teacher or teachers uh, nurtured you enough to go that direction? Yeah, I mean, I think I've had like waves of, of this, you know, which I'm sure we all have. Like when I was a pretty young child, I had a really deep relationship with like nature and, and, and fairies and, and auras. Like I saw colors around people and that kind of like went away at a certain age, especially when we moved and I like went into a totally different social structure. You know, you just kind of like, it was a bit of a shock, right? But this, I had a teacher, my grade school teacher, um, her name was Dawn Deal, and she was just so enthusiastic and supportive of the, of the arts and the creativity inside of each of us. But it wasn't until my high school teacher, art teacher, Hikaru Hirata. He's a Hikaru Jap Hirata? He was a Japanese fantastic realist. Amazing. And he was actually friends with Martina Hoffman and Robert Venosa. Okay. And I just found out actually like last year, Martina told me that she was actually invited to 
to take on this position at the Waldorf school. It was mm. a very young at the time. We were, it was like, I was like the first graduating class in the high school. Oh, wow. And so Martina was invited to apply for this position and she almost did, but then she decided she had too much going on and they knew Hik Hikaru and they asked him if he would. Oh. And so that's how he became my high school art teacher. Look at that big visionary background. Too. It's crazy. And he was then showing artwork of, of Ernst Fuchs uh -huh. in our high school in slideshows. And I vaguely remember that too, but I was also really into my own like little world and all my own stuff. And um, it wasn't until I, it was through another man, Sam Bull, who had this program called the Center for Interim Studies. He came to our school and like offered up his, 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 um, you know, his business as a way to help people if they want to do something besides go straight to college. And um, he was the one that connected me with Michael Fuchs and uh -huh. Phil Rubinoff Jacobson. Okay. And the two of them I met right the day after I graduated high school. Here? In Boulder. Oh. Michael came here and it's the only time he ever came here to do this, mm. a three week class. Oh wow. Um, this was what year? It was 1996. Okay. And, um, and that's the first time I oil painted. And then he asked, um, they like set up this dinner near the end of that class to ask if he would take me on as um as an apprentice uh -huh. and he was like oh, i've always thought that would be a cool thing to do at some point but you know it'd have to be the right situation and i was like the right age he really admired my skills i was really into portraiture at that time i did uh -huh. portraits as like my my senior study in high school and you were 16 i uh, know i was like 18 17 Eight. 18. okay and um and my parents agreed they said okay like if you really want to go and do this study we'll support you with a place to live mm -hmm. and he said uh you don't have to pay me anything now but i want you to pay me back through helping me with my with my work right and so it was like okay like what interesting opportunity right so you were his intern you became his intern yeah basically intern apprentice uh -huh. apprentice so okay. a, a lot of i helped him by painting a lot of paintings a lot of different commissions a lot of works that he he then would come in and finish you right. know like classic uh -huh. and that was like a year and a half two year program he also taught me how to do etchings and I mean, it was really like classical in many ways. And that was one of the things that really attracted me to him because he really um, saw the, the, the importance and the beauty in being able to paint, the, the, to reinterpret the natural world through oneself, that it was a true spiritual practice. And something about that really spoke to me. So you became Michael Fuchs's uh, apprentice, but who is Michael Fuchs and who's Ernst Fuchs for those who don't know? Yeah, so Michael Fuchs is a, is a painter born in, um, he was actually born in the U.S., um, okay. but he's, uh, his father, Ernst Fuchs, uh, was, is Austrian and he was one of the founders of Fantastic Realism and he's like a pretty influential artist for many of like the contemporary like surrealist visionary artists like across the board like he's somebody that is somewhat like he's not as well known but he's influenced a lot of people and his work is like he's done he did everything he was like a painter a sculptor um a, a musician a architect uh i mean he did a lot of like architectural work but he wasn't self an architect he was a renaissance then, man he was a total renaissance and man. he wasn't well known here but i think in uh, austria he was quite famous right yeah he was pretty famous in like austria germany i mean he was also somebody that hung out with like salvador dali and knew a lot of the the artists of his time he was a an artist of monaco so he had a studio like right down the hallway from botero mm -hmm. the colombian wow. the colombian artist and um, you know, he was, he had, he had like quite a bit of success, like in his early thirties, I think he had like five Rolls Royces by the time he was like 35 and he had like really big dreams and visions and he created his own museum. Yeah. His museum the, in Vienna is epic, an epic, epic palace of art that I could only dream of. Right. Yeah. It was beautiful. And he was a really fascinating person and, um, he, he had many students too. like he was never accepted in the main like art academy of vienna to be a professor some of his other contemporaries were like eric brower and um but he he did his own thing like he had, had like a castle outside of vienna where in the summer times like bridget marlin dea schwertberger like phil jacobson 
um, Robert Fenosa, Michael Fuchs, like this is where all of those. Lawrence Car Carana. Lawrence, and Lawrence came later. Okay. Lawrence Lawrence um, was like more around the time when I was working with Fuchs. Okay. I met Lawrence in like I think 1999 or 2000, when we were both working in the Apocalypse Chapel. Uh huh. So after working with Michael Fuchs, he introduced me to his father, and I was like 20 years old, 1920 something like that, and he um, he he said like you know. She'll be one of the best assistants you've ever had, but you have to pay her because that was my issue. I didn't know how I could stay in Austria. I needed to get a job or something. Uh -huh. And um, so I became like a paid assistant of his and I worked with him on so many different projects mm -hmm. uh, for about 10 years. Wow. Yeah. How was that experience of hanging out with Ernst Fuchs, who's quite the eccentric, crazy yeah. character for 10 years? It was amazing. As a 20 year old, young, beautiful painter from America <laughs> it was like it was intense like when I first met him actually I shaved my head when I was 19 okay um, and that was like a, a major signal for me too of like um, of committing to a path committing to the artist path and also wanting very much to be um, not not like given special privileges because of my looks or because of like you know I I wanted to be taken seriously and um, for what my capabilities were and who I was and not for my appearance mm -hmm. and that was like a part of it in some way and so when I met Ernst I had like really short hair and I was very like androgynous I would say in many ways and it was actually it was interesting because when I first went to Monaco to work with him he was convinced there was this painting that he was working on was actually and he it, it was a portrait of somebody that he didn't know who it was and um, it was a knight riding in full armor, riding a horse and a motorcycle at the same time. Hmm. And he was convinced that this knight was me Okay. once he met me. And, he, and so he knighted me and gave me a name. And I like had to kneel and we had to get a sword first, like a, like a really wow. awesome sword. And so that was dramatic. Like a, oh, he was like a theatrical character all uh -huh. the time. It was always like. I was most of the time just kind of like, oh my God, what's happening? <laughs> and then, but we had to go get this sword and that was such an adventure. It was like after lunch, we were like in Monaco, it's like some tourist shop and he picks out the most like bejeweled kind of flashy sword he could find. <laughs> They're selling swords. Mm. <laughs> and then they wanted to wrap it up in the shop for him and he was like, no, 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 no. And so he gets this big sword, he puts it in his belt. <laughs> You know, and he's walking across the plaza and there's all like the the guards with the white gloves and everybody's but they knew who he was. Like he was mm -hmm. this kind of eccentric character that people knew him. Right. And uh and then we like lost him at some point and we turn around and he's in the middle of the plaza, like trying to get the sword out of his belt so he can have a fight with a shadow. Oh man. Yeah, it was just <laughs> like Pan fantastic. Styles. It was fantastic. Yes. Did he like uh do psychedelics? Did that influence his uh eccentricity or was he naturally that way? I they definitely influenced his um his expression and his his everything. I think like in the fifties he was spending time in Los Angeles and he wrote wrote about this quite extensively, um experimenting with peyote. Okay. This is what years? In the 50s. In the 50s. Wow. Yeah. And he was like, he never was interested in anything synthetic. He wouldn't touch anything synthetic, but he definitely, I don't think he ever experienced ayahuasca, but he definitely liked like altered states. But I think the later in his years, he became more, he was, he was also very spiritual and also religious. He was mm -hmm. quite religious and right. Um, yeah. But he did, he did, he would call me up every now and then be like, hey, Amanda, you know that really nice green color that uh, you had? Da, da, da. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, but so, so I would, uh, you know, well, the, well, help what him was out, he get referring some good, for it to, for, you know, some good green, green, green grass, some uh -huh. good, good weed. Oh, uh, okay. He was stuck in code to get some weed. <laughs> it was so sweet. So but you, like, you, I, I, you know, it was though through like, getting high with him and um, and painting and watching him paint that I started to really understand how how the flow worked because in many ways like he didn't like you could tell he didn't really know what he was doing but you kind of assumed it if you didn't know mm -hmm. but then he would like he would dip his brush in the paint and then he would paint and paint until there was absolutely nothing left 
Mm -hmm. And there was something about that continued connection, you know, that just would keep going and it was psychedelic to watch him paint. Uh huh. Right? He was fully channeling. Yeah. And Beautiful. so, and I think it was something that he would tap into and hanging out with him as much as I did, I was like, there was a kind of transmission that happened, right? And in the beginning, you're just kind of like a, a sponge and you're just observing like all of, like observing it, but it was something that just being around him and a lot of like, I was helping him paint his own work, mm -hmm. you know? So it was, it was a fascinating um, thing that I knew at the time too. Like I tried to write it down a bunch or like journal and, but so many times I wouldn't take photos because I didn't want to be that person, you know? You don't want like, to be like me. <laughs> <laughs> but I wish I had. I wish I had taken so many more photos, you know? Uh -huh. Like there were so many times I just, I, I wanted to be supportive and I wanted to be just real with him. And I, and I knew that he appreciated me for that, you know, and he was always super respectful to me. Right. And we had like a really special relationship. It was like all through my twenties and he was all through his seventies. And I was like one of his kids, mm -hmm. you know, but he respected me for, for, I think my, you know, for my commitment and also my talent and my ability. And it wasn't always like working with him wasn't always like, oh, this is your job. This is what you're going to do. It was like, I had to learn to be super fluid also in it and it was like being a part of like a grand experiment that was cr it was wacky as as it could be but like through that I met so many interesting people right and so it was like through him I found out you know I met Dea Schwertberger and I met Robert Venosa and Martina really because of working with the Fuchs family because it was like when I came back to Boulder then it was like oh that's how I that's how um, I got connected with Robert Martina. And then I also met Andrew Jones, like who also grew up in the area. But we didn't meet until I think like 2001. And it was like it started to like the, the scope. Also, when the Internet started to become a thing and we started like posting online, you know, started meeting like others in the world that were also influenced from a similar direction of art, you know. Mm -hmm. And and Fuchs was like this center sent was this character like I met so many people that coming to try to meet him Right that you know everybody wanted to apprentice under him to get gain that lineage almost like yeah. if, if, if you were like under Fuchs, it's almost like You're part of this Generation or lineage that he was rescuing this old-school technique from the Van Eyck's right? Something well, like so that? he was inspired by the early Renaissance painters and so he and some of his friends, they, I mean, and other, there are other, plenty of other people that have been inspired by those kind of glazing techniques. And it's like, what is the, the mediums? How are they doing it? Um, and he, he came up with his own, um, his own rendition of it. Right? Okay. So I'd say it's all inspired by the early Renaissance, but it's not the same way. You know, you're not using the same mediums, the same everything, but it's like, that glazing, that bringing up the light from a dark background and then glazing it thinly with color. And then Fuchs would work in this way that kind of like, he was always changing it up. Mm -hmm. Like he was a true mixed technique artist yeah. in kind of the way that he would merge and, and, and develop things, but he used the white. See, right. and this is something that I've also has stayed with me and been like a major tool in my work. Egg tempera and casein. It could, it can be, it could also be white, white, titanium, white acrylic, okay. or it could be lead white and oil, or it could be titanium white and oil, but it's like bringing up the light and then glazing thin layers of color on top. What you're doing is creating kind of like a stained glass effect, right? Mm -hmm. So it's different if you mix like the white and the, you know, together directly. And this is what they call the mish technique. Yeah. The mixed technique. Yeah. Yeah, so, and so out of that, though, it's like every person that studied with him kind of took, um, took an aspect of it and made it, made it their own, right. you know? So there's not one way, uh -huh. and there's not one right way. Right. You know, I, that's at least what I believe and what I've experienced, and mm -hmm. I kind of encourage ev anybody that studies with me or studies it in general, it's like, it's, it's, it's a concept that is also super conducive to creating visionary imagery, to creating imagery that is 
multidimensional. That is also something that maybe you're also not, not, don't have a clear image of what you want ahead of time, but you go into the process and the layering like continues to reveal it. Right. It seems like Benosa did his own version of it. Mary yeah. Clark Wayne did his own version of it. You got your own. Now, my next question would be, as somebody who's taught so many people this technique, do you find a lot of your students might end up painting a little bit like you? And I know you encourage them to move on and do their own thing, but where, you know, does it ever happen that, uh, you know, people start painting a la Amanda Sage? And uh, is that good or bad in, in your point of view or you don't care or? I mean, I don't really, I don't pay attention to that so much and I definitely don't encourage it, but I don't, I don't mind if somebody feels inspired to follow that line and they feel like something through that and everybody that I've seen maybe mirror it a little bit if they keep going it turns into their own thing you know mm -hmm. and I think we need to kind of copy each other in a way to be able to find ourselves like a stepping stone yeah. to finding your own voice totally mm -hmm. but I think what what I what I focus on more is a process rather than like yeah, and that process can can be, I, th I think it's really basic. I think you could be expressing anything and still use the process, no matter what your, like, like your content or your style is, you know? Mm -hmm. Because it's just working with, like, dark, light, composition, and color, mm -hmm. you know? So it's endless combinations, really. It's endless combinations, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, But I do, one of the things that I've found is an incredibly great tool is the self-portrait and that's something that I because it was such a great tool for transformation and also for learning the the, the like the training of of your hand and your eye you know like because you can learn so much from observing nature and you push yourself to kind of like really draw something the way it is it just expands your toolbox I don't think it's a confining thing you know and so I find that through that it's like doing like any kind of um, sports or yoga or anything that has like pushes you to the edge, it like it teaches you something, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I find that 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 like pushing yourself to the edge in that way is going to open up like things inside of you and in your capabilities that, you know, it doesn't you don't have to keep doing it. And that's what I thought was actually so I found it really important when I was a young person to learn how to paint what I saw because I knew it would be foundational. But when I showed that, say, to, to people at the academy in Vienna, when I was thinking that I might go to school there after, you know, they didn't value it at all. And Realism. I was, yeah. Uh -huh. And they're like, oh, we don't want to see that here. Yeah, it's been done. It's been done. And I was like, well, this isn't like what I want to keep doing, but this is just what I've done and I saw a value in it. And if mm -hmm. you can't see a value in that that was something that I did, then whatever okay i'm going to go figure it out in another way right. but know? it's important to have as you say that foundation of uh good technique because then once you find your voice or your subject matters or your inner inner visions you got a really good tool to express that yeah it's like it's only going to support whatever you're going to be doing you know and i think like you you gain more respect and you also realize that the most exquisite art is like right here mm -hmm. right and all we can do is like God's get close art. to it right and <laughs> right. we can like we sit with it we 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 adore it right you know through our work mm -hmm. and i mean i know your work is like so much more like um of of an interpretation that is not like realistic in that way but it is an adoration, right? It's an adoration of the creative, like, genius that God is, right? Right. Uh, yeah, we can never hold a candle to the artwork of God and all of his created just in this mere physical plane, but, you know, and way, way beyond. But, yeah, we, we honor it. So that chapter in Austria with Ernst Fuchs sounds like such an amazing uh, experience. I, I believe, like, when I got into the visionary art scene around, like, between 2006, 2008, through Tri-14 exhibitions in Seattle, uh, that's where I first got to see your art at a show. I don't think you were back from Europe yet, but I think you came back to America from Europe 
2006, 2007 -ish? It was 2007. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I went to Burning Man for the first time, 2007. And mm -hmm. that was my entry. Um, the way, like, I first felt like I really made contact um, with, the, with the community. And um, I went, I, the only people I knew at Burning Man, Man were Robert Venosa and Martina Hoffman and Andrew Jones. That's great people to know. Yeah. <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> and it was like, it was such a fascinating experience. And Nomi Adana, I'd met him in San Francisco. I knew him through MySpace. So oh. I was like, just like connecting with some artists. And then, and then, you know, then it went from there. It was like, I, I think it was Earth Dance in, in Northern California. That was like my first festival besides um, uh, Burning Man and I was just kind of like wow look at this this whole experience this is a totally different world and it just kind of like went from there and I didn't meet Alex and Allison Gray until um, 2009 uh -huh. it was actually on my birthday which is bicycle day right April 19th in San Francisco I'm guessing no it was actually in New York okay and they were it was the year between the cosm they had in the city and then moving up to the land in Wappingers yeah and uh, they had a, a show that was up at the East West Gallery and they did like a little celebration and a talk there. Okay. And so there was only like 15 people there for some, it was a really small group, and, but I got to meet them in person and, and we ended up like talking forever because it was like, I'd worked with Ernst Fuchs. And yeah. so that was kind of like- Your entry. My entry, I already had like, a, you know, I already had a lot like of experience under my belt and I just kind of walked into I feel like a time, an era too, that was just like, it was interesting. It was like it was, you it was, and it like- It was the roots of North American festival style visionary art. Yeah. And this whole like live painting experience and um, you know, there was, there was all kinds of things. Like we had like the visionary Congress. Well, thing, the Alchemize, like Alchemize and the Big Isle of Hawaii 2010 is where we finally met in person. Right. And that was around the same time that Ray and Moksha family was doing gatherings in Miami. In Miami. Yeah. And then festivals just wanted visionary art more and more. We've met up in uh, Australia 2012 for the eclipse, yeah. uh, in Vision, uh, in Costa Rica. And uh, yeah, we would always meet up around the world. A couple of dready painters <laughs> from two totally different worlds and backgrounds. But we've collaborated too. We've In done some painting. Australia, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then that painting that we did with them, um, that we did a uh, Valerie. Yeah, that's that the piece. Australia one. And then there was the Root Wire sh shows too of 2012. Mm -hmm where I think the first one you just did it with Randall and Roman right and but then the second year we did this train that is at Peace Yoga downtown LA I think yep, it's still there okay cool yeah and uh, yeah that was an interesting experiment <laughs> but uh, even back then you're already dreaming up your your train that's totally. like to 2012 and a, another great time that we hanged out together was obviously at the uh, Tori Superiori Italy um, retreat that you used to have uh, once a year every summer, right? Uh, tell me a little bit about the Italy retreats. That's a very beautiful offering you has, used to have with Lawrence and Florence and Andrew and Maura. At least yeah. that year I went. That year, yeah. Yeah, tell me a little about that it. That was like, tw was that 2012 when you came? That was 2012, yeah. Or 13 or something like that. Uh, no, 12, because that was uh, the same year we met up in Australia. Right. We made the painting and it was after Valerie's uh, surgery and thus why we made the painting to wish her right. healing. Right, right, right. Yeah, so that, the Visions and the Mish Technique seminars, that was started by Lawrence Caruana. And he started that, I think the first one may have been 2008 or nine. And he invited me to come and, and teach with him. And um, that was something that, yeah, it took me a couple years to be able to go and to do that. But it was my first kind of debut of teaching, especially for three weeks. Um, but it was such an amazing exper experience and like Really? The it was the first time you taught? I don't think the year you came maybe was the second. I'm not remembering exactly which one the but first But the Italy was. seminars was your... My first like, like with a group for that segment of time. Mm -hmm. Like, and I don't think I'd been doing workshops really before that. I did a couple of my first workshops, maybe 2010. 
I think it was like here in Chicago. Um, but I was before that I had just had some students like one on one. Like right. I had one girl come study with me for like over a year when I was in Vienna in my studio at the VUK. And um, yeah, but it was like this experience that we had in Tori, like in an eco village, the most amazing food being prepared for us. The wine and then, alone. <laughs> <laughs> and then you get to, to make art and then go swimming in the grotto. Mm. And it was just such this like, you the felt vibe. like you were in a castle. Yeah. It was like Hogwarts, right? Oh, it was so and then, sick. And then people would come from all over the world, so many different characters. And it was like the energy of everybody together was such an inspiring thing. And I found a real love, I think, for teaching through that because I wasn't really like, I was like, what am I going to offer? You know, I was maybe, maybe I was like pushing 30. I was like maybe in my early 30s, but I was like, still felt like I was just barely touching the surface. Mm -hmm. uh, but I realized that I did have a lot to, to offer. And then also like, it was through the, the collaboration and the response that would come from the from the students, you know, mm -hmm. that would be really um, that really like just helped me keep going and finding like ways to support them. So right. that well, you became thing. such a great teacher from it. Yeah, I love it. And it was like and if people kept wanting it, then I kept showing up, you know, mm -hmm. and it was something that also helped me travel and go places and feel really like I was you know, contributing in a nice way. And, but it was beautiful too, over time, people kept coming back, mm -hmm. you know? So it, like the workshops and seminars ended up being like half people that were returning and then others like that would be fresh. So the container would just continue to be like, it had like its own morphogenic kind of um, quality to it, you know? And everybody in that space would leave with something that was more than they expected and like with an expanded perspective and like I knew more and more that it wasn't really about the painting. Mm -hmm. It was actually like community and vibes. It was and community and it's like it's like being surrounded by spiritual artists all wanting the same thing. All wanting the same thing in a different way and not knowing exactly what it is, but we're going towards it, right? And it's like the artwork was this kind of, is this like portal, like you're painting. You have the choice. What are you gonna do with it? And some, and being amazed sometimes with what would happen, and other times being so frustrated, right? But that was like a tool for a teaching of understanding one's oneself, you know, in the world, and like. Um, so to me, it became more and more. And this is when Joe Bob came into my life, you know, realizing that there was like a much deeper teaching um, that was actually the core of what was possible through these painting seminars around um, disidentification and learning what it could be like if we were more aware of, of the machine of the conditioned personality, right? Right, it's almost like you're learning to flow through painting, but it's really about like allowing spirit, may it be your higher self or the oversoul, flow through you and manifest as a painting. Yeah, and then the painting is your thing to check in about that can remind you and it can remind others because it has its own vibration and its own frequency. I believe someday in the future, we're going to be able to listen to paintings. We're mm. going to be able to hear like the stories of the, the transmission of thoughts that came through mm. that the painter was having or even like was listening to oh, while they were creating. It. Like I've had these downloads before about it, that there's going to be like a time beyond this time when we're going to be able to 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 learn so much more from those records of right. the actual physical pieces. It's and almost like a microchip, you yeah, know, like totally. everything has consciousness. We're just not too able to read it as uh, dense physical animals, you know, but as we become more in tune with energetics, we'll be able to read the, the crystals. We'll be able to read the energy inputted into the painting. So I love that. I, I, I don't think I've ever heard that before. So something you might not know or not, you're telling me how you learned how to teach at these Italy retreats, but actually the Italy retreats was the first time I was getting a chance to teach other adults. Um, I had taught uh, some workshops at high schools before, but for me teaching uh, young kids, it's like, well, they don't know anything about art. So whatever I teach them, it's all good. But I never had the confidence to teach adults because like, 
Well, these are grown-ups. Who am I to teach these people who are already developed human beings? But then I was just a student at your retreat, but you guys were like, hey, Chris, you're a developed artist yourself. How about you teach us a class on that? I was like, all right, well, how about I teach some spray painting? And that was the first time I, I, I was like, okay, what, what could I teach? I'll teach out the materials. I'll teach a little bit about the thing. I'll do a demo. And that was the first time I taught uh, a workshop to adults. And from there... I pulled a string and now I, you know, teaching workshops is something that I do. So thanks for that opportunity to start with. But my next question to you would be, did these Italy uh, workshops then create the foundation for the Vienna Academy? And tell me a little bit about that uh, situation. Yeah, so it was through those um, seminars in Italy that we, you know, like, there was more cohesiveness that was built around like a group of artists and Lawrence was really like an instigator of that and bringing people together and I was um, in Vienna uh, spending I, I mean no matter even though I was in the US more starting in like 2009 I was still like in Vienna for a significant amount of time every year and Fuchs was um, had a studio in downtown Vienna at this building that was like the Austrian Culture Center and there was a floor there that was not really being used. It was interesting and I would go and visit him and I made friends with the director and I was like, could I teach a workshop here? And he was like, sure. And then um, and then I thought, well, actually, maybe this could be, maybe this could turn into a school. And since Fuchs was there and I knew it was like in the later years of his life and he always wanted to have more assistance and I was always trying to find more assistance so I could break free and go do my other stuff <laughs> like for years. And so that's, um, that was something like I was pretty good with making friends with people and kind of planting seeds and ideas. And um, so I like made those connections and was there kind of like convincing everybody it was a good idea. And mm -hmm. so that's how the Vienna Academy started. And Lawrence and Florence were really interested in taking on that role and really starting that, um, that project. And so they moved to Vienna from France where they were living. And, um, and started the Vienna Academy of Visionary Art. Mm -hmm. And so that was like, that was an awesome project. I would go once a year to teach with them and, uh, and to continue to support the project as I could. But it was, it, I, I mean, I was like moving around a lot through all those years. And um, yeah, that's how that came to be. And then in 2020, um, the, the whole global pandemic thing, you know, really, put them in a hard position because their students were from all over the world and they had also just opened the cultural center part of the academy and um, yeah they had to make the hard decision to close it mm. and um, but I was at a position I just finished a winter tour in Costa Rica and LA teaching doing the Envision Festival and, and, um, and was in a position to kind of like take things online and so I jumped right into starting the vision train nonstop vision train global art jam and then also um, starting a, a like a online workshop fundraiser series to help them in the financial challenge of having to stop the school mm -hmm. and I did that together with Alicia Sacred Heart and the vision train became a place where it was like it was the invitation is like guys we're we're like all in quarantine basically which is like great for artists like mm -hmm. we, we know what that time. is <laughs> it's for studio time let's like hunker down support each other and making the most important work we ever have and like my call to my students was also like guys you've learned you've studied with with me and many other people um now's the time to really like integrate that and bring that through and 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 step it into a, a, a new realm with with this opportunity that the world is in this great transformation and shift and um yeah well when we were in italy uh 2012 you kept on talking about this train chris i'm gonna make this train it's gonna go around the world with all these special people and inspire and we're gonna change the world to something new and beautiful and i was kind of like I don't understand the logistics of this, Amanda. What, like, there's not even train tracks going through all the, what, are you gonna go do train tracks across the ocean? Or is it gonna fly back to the future freestyles? Or how, how is this gonna work? I didn't really understand it. And then when 2020 happened and 
you wanted to do this nonstop Zoom thing. First time you brought it up, I'm like, damn, that sounds ambitious and a hell of work that I don't want to do. Um, I ended up doing this podcast instead as my service for communication. But then you did that nonstop soon, and then you combined that dream of this train that you kept on painting, and, and then the vision train takes shape. And I love it. I love it. I love the community you've made. Uh, all these people from around the world are able to find a community and a resonance and creativity, workshops, speeches, DJs. Um, tell me a little bit more about this train project you've done, what you like the most about it. Is it too much work on your plate or, you know, what's the pros and cons? How far is it going to go? Or you're just still discovering as you go? Yeah, the latter. <laughs> <laughs> it's an experimental international creative space station. <laughs> and it's something that I knew when I saw the train back in like 2011, 2012, I was like, this is such a big vision, but I had a sense that it was something that like, it wasn't just mine. It was something that I was like tapping into and it was something that would continue to reveal itself. And it was something that was worth kind of like committing my life to in many ways. Like, I don't know exactly what it's going to be. I don't have, and it morphs and it changes as it goes, but it's a story that keeps giving actually like a, kind of like a, a deeper sense of purpose to me and it can carry everything it can carry all of the anything that i want to put on it and it can carry everything you want to put on it and everything you want to put on it it's got different you wagons put on it. yeah it's like the 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 longest most beautiful train ever made and it's still coming and it's still great gaining momentum it left the station and it's still going to leave that station how long has it been so far um, I don't know. I think the train's been coming for a long time. Cat Stevens. Um, okay, you're talking about the metaphorical <laughs> train. I'm talking about the, how long has that Zoom call lasted? The Zoom call. Okay, we're almost at two years. Okay, cool. So um, March 24th is when the train left the station, 2020. Oh, wow. And it was the first eight months. It was completely nonstop. Like Summer we had, solstice. We came, no, it's spring. It's like the spring uh, equinox. Spring solstice. Yeah. Spring, a little bit after the spring equinox, but when it was, when it started, it was, happened to be a new moon. Mm -hmm. um, happened to be synchronicities, but everything's it was, aligned. Yeah. And so it was something that like we, we made a system. So it was like 24 hours with people in all different time zones. You need to come up with a like train time. So we came up with train time and there was four trips in a mm -hmm, day and mm -hmm, 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And each trip was six hours long. Mm -hmm. And we made up a system to, um, and an invitation for people to become conductors. Mm -hmm. And so once you were a conductor, then you had access to different um, ways to like book a trip and to um, share about your trip. It's starting to get chilly, huh? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to keep my microphone out here. But, yeah. You can still see my face. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and, and through that, it was like an invitation for everyone to, like, learn new skills and to share their, like, to give back and to exchange. I mean, it was this place of, like, of... of Communication. Is a train, communication, training station is a place to um, interview each other, um, teach workshops, um, share music, jam, do all these things. And so and out of that, it's like a lot of and whoever felt the resonant to to keep like connected and to stay would stay on, you know, and then it was like this ebb and flow of like, you got to take a break sometimes. Like you get addicted to the train and you'd stay on the train kind of like nonstop for oh, a while. Really? And then you realize you have to take a break. And that's what for me was kind of a big deal too. It's like you get burned out, uh -huh. you know, and it was like experiencing the burnout, but experiencing that like it would keep going because we take turns uh -huh. and it became like a, a platform that, that, you know, was because of many people coming together and seeing the value in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it, it saved, I think, a, a lot of people's, like, minds in Mental some ways. Mental sanity. And having a place to connect and not be alone, uh -huh. you know, to be alone together. And, um, yeah, it's still now, like, there's plenty of times where it's a renegade train. Oh, yeah? But 
there's really cool stuff that happens sometimes in the renegade train. What does that it's mean, still, renegade train? Like there's people who just throw down without it being planned and yeah. it ends up being something amazing that nobody expected? Totally. Uh -huh. So we have now like, um, we have a Mighty Networks that we use to schedule like events and um, communicate through that platform. Mm -hmm. And so it's like pretty independent. Like if, you, if you're a conductor, if you're trained as a conductor, you can like, um, you can schedule your own trip and it doesn't have to be six hours anymore, but sometimes we'll stream. Um, sometimes we'll, you know, various things will happen on there. And it's like, it's still in a phase of, of development. Um, and I think it always will be, you mm -hmm. know? And so out of, out of the train and out of the, uh, out of Vava, the Vienna School of Visionary Art, um, now like Vitra has been born and the uh -huh. Vitra Academy is like, yeah, it's the newest visionary art school out there, right? And it's online, but it's and also... And this is your creation? It's myself and Alicia Sacred Heart. Mm -hmm. And also, yeah, I mean, it's primarily the two of us that because she was the one really helping me with the workshops, taking them online over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. And it just made sense to kind of like keep going in that momentum to give it more of a platform. Mm -hmm. So it was like Vitra became the Vision Train mm. Academy. It's like a sister project. Right. And someday there will be more physical locations, but it's kind of it's it's been special having this online place because we um, it's more affordable for quite a few people and we don't have to deal with all like the, the challenges of traveling still now. And um, yeah, it's a foundation. It's a place to like to explore. And and we're doing it a little different than a lot of other online art schools that we've seen out there because we're really doing everything live. And we're recording it so people can jump back in. But a lot of the, the main class space is, is done in kind of like a Zoom meeting that's not like a webinar. It's like, here's just the teacher and there's the, mm -hmm. the students, you know. Right. It's not a recording. Well, I mean, for people that miss the live, they do get the recording. But mm -hmm. it's like, it's much more of a, of a community kind of circle. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that, that's really important to us to continue to develop that and to make sure that it's not like we're not just trying to sell you something, you know, like this is a, this a, is a community. Group. And I got to say, like visionary art in the beginning when I heard the term, like I wasn't too like, I mean, it's such a broad term. Right. And it felt a little, little preposterous almost like a little bit pretentious, like, pretentious. Um, and I but when it was like visionary art and culture, like the culture part is what really got me. I feel like I've always been really interested in the in the grander story of what it is to be a human being in a creative setting. You know, like the culture of food, the culture of music and dance and art and the culture of communication, of being like, you know, creative in every part of your life, mm -hmm. you know. And so to me, that's what I see the train can carry all of that, can carry the goodness of humanity and and be an example, right? It's like, let's be an example and let's like spread spread the seeds and nurture them too. It's like, not let's not just come to a place, throw a huge party and then leave a bunch of trash and leave. Right. You know, like totally. that's, 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 that's unresponsible. Right. And so like, how do we come with integrity and with experience with um with with goodness to share and how do then we try to be our our higher selves to the best of our abilities in everything mm -hmm. right and so this is where it's like to me the train isn't just about art it's not just about painting i mean that's what i do right like that's what i can offer that's something that has been my my offering but I think it's for everyone that feels curious because I believe that everybody's an artist. Not everybody has to be a painter, mm -hmm. right? But, but you're an artist, you mm -hmm. know? Like, and to be more artful in the things that you do, no matter what you do, is like going to help us elevate our, our like remembering what we're here for now. Like, cause if, if, we don't in this generation in this decade really really change the way we are like um living and being like in on this planet then the future generations are gonna really are not gonna have much right so 
you are obviously a community person. You're here to support, to teach, to share, to communicate. And this takes me to the next project that seems to be a more, more recent project for yourself that I witnessed in, my, in the last Miami Art Basel when I saw you out there, is the uh, Regeneration Project. What is that and what's your involvement with that? Regeneration? Regeneration. Or Regenerations. Regenerations, sorry. But I would like that you just said Regeneration because that's actually the name of my next seminar oh. coming up. Okay, yeah, I'm psychic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it's all in the regen. Regen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? Regen. Like that root. Bringing back the next you know? generation. It's like, it's, and I, I'm thinking about this a lot, of course, right now, because that's the theme of my upcoming workshop. And it's also the title of my painting that was the first time I painted the train, mm -hmm. which has been like, um, that's been 10 years since I did that painting. And it's very much about this like acknowledgement of the rebirth mm -hmm. that we are constantly in and the responsibility around this time now. So the Regenesans, that, that project that I was a part of in Miami was with the Design Science Studio. Mm -hmm. And um, that's like a prediction actually from Buckminster Fuller around there being a time when many of the institutions and world kind of like uh, politics and, and, and environment, a lot of things would start breaking down mm -hmm. and we would have to we would be forced to reconsider um, our impact, right? Do you think we're here now? In that we're time? totally here now. Mm -hmm. It's now. It's now. Like, and I, I saw this coming. I knew this even as a child. I mean, I was kind of presented with these like, you're going to take the green road or the red road, mm -hmm. right? That's an ancient prophecy, right? Mm -hmm. That or ancient. I mean, it came through the the Native Americans of North America and many other cultures, you know, have predicted that there would come a time where humanity would have to really like wake up. And right. in many ways is like the ancestors of the light skinned people, right? That have were colonizers, you know, and it's like the ripple. And I see it like our responsibility and all of us that have access and privilege, the privileges to these mediums, right? Of like having time to do these interviews and having the, all the all What are the we doing with our power? What are we doing with our power and how can we, how can we actually listen more, right? Instead of, instead of being, um, yeah, I don't wanna say like, like take, taking, right? Like as in a kind of, um, cultural norm to be like um, uh, to be always going out to new frontiers and I don't want to say dominating but that's like what has happened if you look back right we we need now to learn how to we need to really collaborate and we also need to be supportive in the recovering I think of what's been lost there's a lot of really valuable wisdom and in, in the medicines and in arts, in, in, in building. <laughs> There's so many things that have been um, mm, buried, right? And I find that like, you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> of course, it's sad. It's terrible. It's, there's a really like heavy, there's a deep heaviness in that. But um, we need to find a way to collaborate, to resurface, to honor, to remember that we all belong right we all belong we're all children of this earth and how can we reconcile how can we reconcile remember and regenerate right so the regenesans is like this blossoming of 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 a of a time when we come together as the rainbow children right like can we do it i mean i might be totally naive and that's one of my superpowers <laughs> And I accept that. Well, you create the world you believe in. So uh, being sometimes confident, overconfident, naive, or able to dream up the possibility that we might make it as a better, beautiful world of healing, unity, and peace, that's not, only, that's not a bad thing. That's what's fucking needed for us to create it. Well, and that's what the train is in many ways to me. It's a distraction maneuver. <laughs> It's a distraction maneuver into the possibility of how it could be if we actually reconciled, remembered, and then became and lived in the majesty of the beauty of like 
what it is to be in this existence. Like it is like we have, it's, it's the contrast that is real, right? Mm -hmm. It's not one or the other. It's not the light or the dark, right? And so both exist with the full rainbow in between, right? right. And so like acknowledging that, honoring that and not being afraid of it, but at the same time, continuing in that path forward of being like, it can happen that we can find more appreciation mm -hmm. and compassion, right? right? Do I believe that it, things should be just perfect it, to my ideal? I've learned that that is actually impossible. impossible. It's, not, it's not the nature of this dualistic realm. No, no. Uh, and it almost seems like the darker things get the more is the push for the light to come out one way or another so my next question would be are you optimistic that humanity will make it and that we will turn into the positive humanity that we all want to see um well, what's your dream i mean i'm <laughs> is it possible at least uh, sure I think it's all possible, you know, and I think it's probably all going to happen and more in probably all levels of dimension of existence. And, you know, I, I'm sometimes I'll feel afraid for the possibility of like the d continued disconnectedness of humanity from the earth and from like the root of of like you know what of the essence i guess of life but then i have an experience that is like so affirming that that cannot be lost that we're here in this great school of of um of exchange you know of challenge of of being able to and the challenge is a part of the is a part of the process process yeah it's totally a part of the process. And so that's like... Without it, the reward wouldn't be so delicious once we do go back to balance. But see, the thing is, it's not about that thing down the line, you know? And that's what I think more and more I'm reminded that that's not the goal. Mm -hmm. The goal is to become more present now and more appreciative and more like aware of like the possibility in the present moment. Because most of the time we're either living out there or we're living back there. Mm -hmm. We're not living right now. And right. so in our thoughts, that's where we live. And that's, that's actually, I think, the trick. And if we be can become more like alive now, then, then the natural actually essence of life is goodness. And I think is to explore and be curious and to be creative, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I hope so. I hope I hope to, con to continue to experience the the flowering of the possibility of what it is to be human. And, you know, I'm along for the ride. It's like every day is a new opportunity to brings a new challenge. And as more and more challenges come, it's like, OK, how do I continue to show up? Right. You know, and whatever may be will be whatever that future that's not here yet. Let's be in the presence. Let's sit in this mud and be grateful for the process of what we're learning and surrender to whatever the Most High wants us to experience. Either way, we go back to source right. sooner or later. So sooner or later we do. And I think we have the opportunity, though, to be, um, to be an expression of that source and to remind each other of that. And that this is an opportunity. Being alive now is an incredible gift. And that it's not about then and after, after this time. It's, it's about the life that we can cultivate now and the relationships that we can have with each other, mm -hmm. you know? And this is where like, you know, any practice that can bring you in a place of remembering and a place of like, you know, I, I, remembering is the best way to say it, I think, because it's, it's a time out of time. It's a time out of time in art making, music making, dancing, being in that celebratory space 
is like is the essence of the universe i think mm -hmm. and so that's where like my journeys in meditation my journeys in painting my journeys with psychedelics have continued to remind me of that you know and that's something that yeah that's what is that's what is and and as soon as we get lost in the fractal of the machine of the control and the domination of the story of of all the coulds shoulds woulds you know that's where we get lost in the story of the conditioning mm -hmm. and now is the time the regeneration is the breaking free of the conditioning and to remember who we truly are and what we're capable of mm -hmm. well that's super beautiful and no matter what happens we'll try our best and continue being of service because that's our nature and pray that the positive timeline will be the one that we all attract together. Uh, but thank you so much for the work that you do, Amanda. I really appreciate uh, everything that you do. Mm. And thank you so much for uh, doing this conversation with me. Uh, I want to give you a hug. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Love, you. Love you too, Amanda. Thank you for this conversation. And thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of Chris Dyer's Creative Friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please like, share, comment, and I'll see you next episode. Blessings. Woo! All right. Next episode, my guest will be John Gay. Mm -hmm. um, the way the, the mycelium connection is like two or three layers of topsoil. It connects everything and every plant grows through it. It's very amazing seeing that you have some mushrooms that cause hallucinations or psychedelic experiences, right? You as a human think you're the most advanced species on the planet, but I can eat this mushroom here and it makes me question my reality. No, no, you're not the most advanced species on the planet. Actually, the most advanced species on this planet are probably these trees and plants growing out here. Mm -hmm. But they all grow through this mycelium. So they think you even compare the mycelium to your brain. Like, you cut a road into the dirt, you're cutting off that connection that the mycelium had. So they're going to reroute it. So please make sure to subscribe, like, comment, and share. Big thanks, and see you next episode. Peace.